Father, I thank you for your eternal, your blessings, your righteousness, your kingdom standard. You don't have to put up with anything from us, but I thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your power. According to your loving kindness and the multitude of your tender mercies, please look down upon us. Forgive us when we do wrong, chasten us if that's what it takes to turn us around, but warn us with your holy and righteous word. Calls us to be the people that you would have us to be, that we would walk with you, and that we would talk with you, and that you could lead us and guide us into realizing that it's your kingdom that must be advanced. It's not our agenda. It's not our ways. It's not our thoughts. It's all about you. And I'm asking you to, as we go through these scriptures, to remember that you gave this to us so that we would have proper lessons in how to treat you and how to advance your kingdom. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. Every time you turn around, or if you turn on your television, somebody's being talked about. Someone will be slandered. You will see all kind of acts of debauchery. You will see on television ads that cause people to become discontent with what they have. Television shows that will show children that your parents aren't all of that. Well, if my parents could be like this person, or if my mom could be cool like this person, or take me on trips like this. When I was younger, they used to have a television show that would do that to people, and they called it Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And the man said, his name was Robert Leach. And we're going to go look at Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Well, he, I think he's dead now. How about that? That's a lifestyle of the rich and famous too. They die. All of these things that happen, we find it in the Bible. We find debauchery. We find envy. We find hatred. We find evil. We find spiritual beings. We find, when I say spiritual, I'm not just talking about people saying I'm spiritual. Everybody's spiritual. You haven't said anything big to me. You just thought the same thing you're saying. I can talk. When you do that, I know it. I'm talking about beings that are other dimensional. Well, in the midst of all of that, we see the kingdom of God moving. And those that are part of the kingdom of God often don't move with the kingdom's agenda and it causes problems we've been going through the book of numbers and hopefully we're beginning to tie this book of numbers and see how it is used what we call the new testament how it applies in our life when we see when god shows how he operates so you can go and learn his patterns his parameters you can learn what it is when he give you the concrete uh, pictures of what he's going through in the scriptures and then we take that and we see the type and the shadow and it helps us to understand how to make application so in the book of numbers we've seen god do a couple of sentences to let you know that everything he knows who you are he lets you know the worth of each one there was a price for each individual he lets you know that all of the first one belonged to him he claimed authority over the people not only that he lets you know that he dwells in holiness he dwells with righteousness he does not like defilement we've covered that we show that there are special people or people that want to get close to him they can actually dedicate themselves and become closer to the most high god or some people can make a vow we dealt with the nazarite do you all remember that in the sixth chapter we show that the blessing of god comes when his name is on you did you hear what I said? Let me change my voice to like Billy did when I was a boy. Did you hear what I said? When the blessing comes upon you, it's because God's name is on you. It does not mean that the blessing of God is on you just because you have money 
or just because you have fame, or just because you're good looking, or just because whatever that you have that you enjoy. Because you could be destitute, tormented, and afflicted according to Hebrews chapter 11. And the Bible says in the King James Version, they obtain good report. That Greek word behind that is they received a good witness. Well, when you look at that, they received good report. That they received that God was pleased with them when they didn't look like it. What about us? What about us? He showed in all of his blessings that he had set for them, that he wanted his name on them. I want you to do it. I want you to remember that I brought you out of Egypt. One, I want you to remember that when I brought you out of Egypt, that I gave you the picture of death. I gave you a sacrificial uh, lamb that you would put on there and that you are coming out of that world. You're dying to that old world. You are coming to me and the sin that you have on you in Egypt, the dirt, the filth that you have on you from Egypt. I'm going to redeem you out of Egypt. I'm redeeming you from Pharaoh. I'm redeeming you from those gods that you've tied yourself up with. Don't tell Tim that many of them didn't get tied up with those gods because I read the book of Joshua. When you read Joshua chapter 23 and chapter 24, you will see that they were tied up with those other gods. You will also see that in Genesis chapter 25, when God comes back and, and talks to Jacob or Israel and tell them, get the gods away from them. Now we see they did the Passover. We see that it was important for them to do it, and he has appointed days. We've shown that God set up his tabernacle so that he could dwell in the midst of them, and he was showing him how holy it is to have his house in the midst of them, and that he had separated and segmented it out. That's important for you to know because of the fact you are going to be representing the house of God. We are not to be defiling the house of God. It doesn't matter what your world does. It doesn't matter what you get on the news. Everything you see on the news is not for you to go and be what you call a newspaper or a CNN, a Fox News, or a MSNBC, what you call end time specialist because you let somebody make you think that they know more about the workings of this world than they do. What you need to understand is God shows them I'm going to give you a feel of a cloud to lead you in the daytime. To me, I'm going to give you a pillar of fire in the nighttime to lead you. That's me in that. And I'm going to have you to have different trumpets so that you can hear my sound when I want you to do what you need to do. But then, yes, I've just gone through the book of Numbers in summation. Yes, I did, because I want you to be where I am. Then we see as God begins to move out, the beautiful thing that Moses was saying, Arise, O Lord, arise and scatter your enemies. Why? Because we're doing what you said. We're fulfilling what you told Abraham. You said your seed will possess the gates of his enemies. We're going to go do it. Then, then, then when you come back, Lord, come back and rest and bless your people. Well, we see that one of the things about God is he doesn't do it like we think that he would. You see, when I was little, give you a mental break. There was a cartoon called Underdog. It was a square-headed dog, okay? Really, a square-headed, blockhead dog called Underdog. They called him Shoeshine Boy. And when something would happen, he'd go into a phone booth, open up his ring, take this little pill, and then he'd bust out and be Underdog, and he'd be so strong. So strong. God doesn't operate like that in us. And if he does operate like that in us, that's not normal for all of the time. You so what he does is he carries us through the way of humility. He carries us through the way of meekness. He carries us under the yoke. Just like a man that's got a farm, you got a farm and you got 60 yoke of oxen or 60 oxen and they're strong and they're powerful. If they are not under the yoke, all of that strength can damage your property, kill people, be in other people's yard, costing. But if that power is under the yoke, that man can use that ox to do much good, feed himself, feed the ox, 
feed other people, make money, etc. But the children of Israel didn't like when they didn't like God's yoke. They didn't like his manner. He gave not manner, he made any any R. I'm saying manna. He gave them food to eat from the sky. Do would be on the ground. And they could gather, they could beat it, they could make it into cakes and things of that nature. They said, we get tired of that manna. Yes, we covered that in chapter 11. And we also covered in chapter 11, there was one other thing they hated. We don't have no meat to eat. We don't have no meat. We liked it better when we were in Egypt. When we were in Egypt, oh, we could have culinary skills. Uh, there was, they, they had an Egyptian chef Ramsey, you know, and, and that Egyptian chef Ramsey, he could cook with those leeks and the onions and the god oh the food was so good all of the food critics loved it and we loved it yeah right so god gave them quail they lusted for what they had back during the time when they were with other gods they lusted for what they had when they were in bondage. They lusted for what they had before they were redeemed. They lusted for what they had when it, when Israel was not being taken care of as the son of God. They lusted for what they had when they were under the dominion of someone else. And they did not like what it was like to be under the dominion of God. Whereas God has said explicitly, Moses tell Pharaoh, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 4, 22 and 23. Israel is my son, my firstborn. Let my son go so that he may serve me. Well, that brings us to chapter 12. Chapter 12, we deal with the same people. They've been out of the land of Egypt for about a year and two months. We're talking about 13 to 14 months at the max, and God has already slaughtered many of them. He has already shown them that I don't play. My saving you don't give you right to tell me what to do. It doesn't give you right to defile me. It doesn't give you right to change my days of ordinances. It doesn't give you right to be able to complain about what I do as if you got some say-so in how I run stuff. It's my kingdom. Let's make sure we get that right. So we'll get up and say, I'm a father. I didn't have it. How would it be that name? You know, that little, I told you a long time ago, the little boy says, I know God's name. I said, what is it? It's Howard. Where you get that from? Our father, which are never Howard. Well, hallowed or holy be your name is what it says. Thy kingdom come. Whose kingdom? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Whose will? Thy will. Where? In earth. We have this treasure we call life in earthen vessels. We have the kingdom of God in earthen vessels. We have the spirit of God in earthen vessels. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our manna, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's a strong thing to ask, God. You better make sure you're doing it. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil, the evil one. Notice the last part that I wanted to get to. For thine, that's what we're dealing with tonight. For thine is the kingdom. For what? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The moment that we take over God's kingdom with a magisterium like they do in the Catholic Church or a board of elders in some other kind of groups or a pontificate in some other kind of groups, the moment that we allow ourselves to be up under that kind of rulership, whether it's some kind of convention, a Baptist convention, a Methodist convention, a Seventh-day Adventist convention, if if, if, that's the qualifier, if that convention is outside of the will of God and they want to innovate, they want to bring in what is called feminism, if they want to bring in feminism in it, if they want to rule by jealousy and political power, if they're trying to overthrow God's kingdom order, it is to be damned. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. How does God feel about the overthrow of his kingdom order through jealousy, feminism, 
and such like. Huh? Yes, all of this is being shown. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you cheat. To overcome this kind of thing, one has to become faithful to God's kingdom order. Once you're faithful to God's kingdom order, you begin to realize you'll say like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah said, and I know some people, who is that? Well, we've gotten used to calling them by their slave names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Tim put Daniel in there too. They said, when those three young men, when they were going to throw them in the fire, we're not careful to answer you. We're not careful. We're not anxious. Our God can deliver us. And God did deliver. And then what did Job say? Though he slay me, what will he do, Andrina? Yet will I trust him. This is where we need to be with God's kingdom order. If you don't think that I'm telling you the truth, I'll give you one more for free. When the son of God was on earth and he prayed to God, if it be possible, remove this cup. But it wasn't possible. So he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. How much more then as we go through the 12th chapter of this book of Numbers to see what God has to say? I think I'm going to let, when I don't just think it, but I want to let the black peel read for us tonight. I like the way the black peel read it. Numbers. Chapter 12. And Miriam and Aaron spake that against not Moses the because of peel. the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, I don't like that, you all. You all, what happens is sometimes if I'm not using this peel, here to go quiet. I want you to hear it in complete dramatization. Read for Tim. Numbers. Chapter 12. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward the people removed from Hazeroth, and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Mm. Just listen to what had happened. What we see happening in here is some people getting ready to try to destroy God's kingdom order. See a taste of what we call feminism. 
We see a taste of jealousy. We see some self-exaltation. And what it really boils down to is this. God, the way that things are going, we have an improvement. We, we have an innovation that would make things better. We want what is called egalitarianism. We want total equality. We want everyone to be equal. Now, although, God, you have set up the tabernacle right there, you didn't even make the whole tabernacle itself to be equal because on one end you have the Ark of the Covenant and then in another part you have the shoe bread, the candlestick, and you also have the, uh, what's that thing, the altar of the incense. And then in another part you have the laver and you have the altar. Even that thing has different parts and different sections. And then on the outside you have the priest and then on the outside of them you have the Levites and then you have the leaders of the congregation with their banners, and then you have everybody else. You have shown that you have order. Yet when it comes to your ruling order, we're going to unravel that. And we're going to see how the Most High looks at this kind of thing. When I say the Most High, I don't just mean the Most High. I mean the Most High God. It, that, that's, a, that's a superlative term. Not that we're talking about good, better, best. Are we talking about more and most? I'm talking about the most high of all the spiritual and celestial beings that there is, that all of them have to buckle down to him. If you read Psalm 82 and 6, you'll see he'll stand in the midst, and in the midst stands in the middle. He'll stand in the midst of them, and he'll execute and say, I'll make you die like me. And then, then he say it. Yeah, he did. I know he did. The Bible says here that we just read, and Miriam the sister of Moses, the older sister of Moses, the one that went out with the little ark, the one that saw Pharaoh's daughter pick up and open up the ark and the little baby cry. The same one that went and got her mother and got her paid for nursing the baby, the big sister. And Aaron, the older brother by three years, family, Hebrews, children of Israel, and all these people that have seen and understood that you would think what God has done, they're getting ready to try to overthrow God's judgment. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. I like the next word, because. Why? What you do it for? Because of the Ethiopian woman, who he had married. Oh, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, 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 some people say it's because she was black and they were white. How about if the Ethiopia at that time went all the way up under Egypt and there were a different group of people and they and that these people were in charge and they were not acclimated to being Hebrews. They weren't acclimated to being Egyptian. Could be also due to the fact that you married this woman and she might be close to you and have some say so. I don't know. But we know that it was because of the Ethiopian woman. Now I couldn't determine. I tried. I've tried over and over again. I have plenty of resources. And I read people that have maybe more than me. We don't know if Zipporah died. We don't know if Zipporah died. But we do know that in Exodus chapter 4, she had a problem with circumcision. When she cut little Gershon's foreskin off and threw it at the Moses' feet and called, actually, she may have thrown it at his loins because when you look at the word feet and you look behind the Hebrew, it could actually mean feet or she could have thrown it at his genitals. Uh, we got raggled, but you, you look at that word, you'll see it. But here is the point. When she did that, she called him a man of blood. I don't know. So if you ask me in a discussion, I'm still not going to know. What I suspect is you got a person that's coming in with the head man, and she is not of our quote-unquote group. But 
we know that sometimes the Midianites were caught where they, well we're not just sometimes but sometimes they would come in and be around them but the Midianites were the descendants of Abraham as well and sometimes I'm seeing in history I can't prove it that the Midianites and the Cushites that's what Ethiopians are they can be called some of the same group let me just tell you this it says Ethiopian if you go up and check behind me like I would do if you were teaching and I was watching you, I would go back and cheat. I mean, check behind you. If you're telling me something, I don't know. I believe she was Ethiopian. Whether or not she had some um, Midianitis stuff in her, because easily if your daddy is a Midianite, you, I mean a Cushite, you're going to be a Cushite. You're going to be what you are. But they had a problem. And I just want you all to know that I did try to find information on that. But can we deal with what I do understand? Will you give Tim some more water? You don't have to rush. I, I'm, I'm, I don't need it right now. I just know my glass getting empty and my voice going to in a minute. I'm going to get dry. But it says, they spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman that he married. He had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, I want you to understand something. When it says, and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Why are you using that voice, Tim? I want you to, those that, I think I might start in the future, open up my Strong's Concordance so that I can give people the number. But a lot of times, Strong's Concordance is not going to give you what the morphology, whether it's singular or plural or whether it's feminine. But here, it's important for me to make it known. When it says, has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses, the word spoken is the verb. And the verb is, the verb where it says, has he spoken by Moses? We start looking and seeing that what there is saying that it's feminine. It's feminine the way that this thing is coming out. It's coming out that Miriam had something to do with this. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? That's a problem. Now, has he not spoken by us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men that were upon the earth. And I want to throw this in here just in case. Because I did skip something. In that first verse, where it says spake, as opposed to the second verse where it says spoken, mm -hmm. I'm doing English. Spake is the one that's in the feminine. Thank you, precious love. Spake, if you're going to, where it says in Miriam and Aaron spake, that is the feminine. Okay. He would not say Tim and Ann went to the store as she, or you wouldn't say, uh, Ann and Tim, so and so, and she. So, was what was the emphasis is being put on the older sister? The, the emphasis is being put on her okay. as if this is of her. And we know Aaron has shown some weakness. Tim, where you get that from? Exodus 32, when he made the gold again, we, we what not. That's what King James saying at WOT. We what not. What's going on with this Moses? We don't know nothing. And so they made, he said, let's make us gods. Then when Moses come and chastise him, I, let me say it like this. I but don't know but what happened to, to the but Moses. They 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 gave me the rings and and I but throwed it in the fire and it became out. It just came out of camp and he lied. Bible said he used a graving tool. And Miriam and Aaron spake feminine against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married for. He had married an Ethiopian woman and they said, "Has the Lord indeed spoken?" Only keyword. Only by Moses. Please understand this. Grumbling and complaining happened in the chapter before. Grumbling and complaining happened because we want some. We miss the leeks, the onions, and the garlic, and the good food that come from that part of the world. We are tired of the manna from that part of the world. We don't have any meat. And Moses, Lord, these people, they, Lord, if you go treat me like this, Lord, please kill me. And the Lord said, come on out. 
bring the head, bring the rulers that you know, bring 70 men out here. And what I'm going to do is take the spirit off you and put it on them. And then El Dad and me dad don't show up and the spirit is on them. So now imagine what it must have been like. At one time you got Moses and Aaron and then his sons, they get to be under Aaron, and all the priests are under Aaron. Now here's some other people, they got the Spirit of God on them. Now, Tim, 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 you don't necessarily know that's what it is, but I can tell you now, Miriam, I've been here. And now here these other people, they moving up. They're being elevated. And so the Bible says, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. We see one, we don't like God's order. Number two, we see a woman's in. I want equality with Moses. I want equality, or I at least want to be over the head of Moses. I want to be equal with him. I don't want to be subservient to him. I don't want to be subservient to this little brother of mine. I don't want to be. I, and, and Aaron, come on. Come on. Can we older than him? They may not have said nothing about being older, but the problem is we got a problem with Moses being in charge. He did have a problem when he saw the bush on fire. Were you raised in Pharaoh's house? According to Acts chapter 7, were you trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptian? Were you prepared for that role? Miriam, Miriam, oh sweet Miriam, are you a man? When he chose men to be the heads, three of them on the east, three on the west, three on the north, three on the south, did he choose any sisters to be in charge, to be able to go out to war and to prepare to go and take over the kingdom? Did he? Did he take any of the women and give them a full week to be able to be dedicated, sanctified, and certified, and consecrated, and put the blood on their right ear, their right thumb, their right toe, and do the sacrifices, and risk having to go in and have to cut up the animals just right, and do everything that's necessary to do the sacrificial system? Did he? So how are you going to all of a sudden put yourself in the position that no other woman is in in this particular group? Tim, why do you call it feminism? Tim, why do you why are you jumping on women? I'm not jumping on women. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Let's, let, let, let's see what the Bible says about that kind of spirit. You think that stuff started in the 60s with cigarettes and people want to smoke cigarettes and what's his name? Bernays. What was Bernays' first name? Edward? Mm -hmm. Edward Bernays doing this stuff with what they call public relations and showing people how to manipulate people with the media and all of this. In Genesis chapter 3 and 15, we find that the woman is already determined. She wanted to determine what's good and evil for herself at the behest of the beguiling one, the murderer that's from the beginning, the liar that's from the beginning, Satan. So God, God tells what I'm going to do. Adam, you've done your dirt. I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to curse the ground for your sake. I'm going to let make you live out of sweat of your brow. But woman, listen what I'm going to do. I'm going to, Genesis 3 and 15, you all, I'm sorry for not giving me the address. God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. We're talking about the serpent. I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Now, one of the things about this, you all, I got a wife. She's not my head, but she shows a good neck. Boy, <laughs> she turned that rascal. Years ago, she told me that the devil hates women. And she went about through this passage and just opened up things that I hadn't seen. God said, I'm going to make your enemies, you, serpent, and the woman, and your seed, and his seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. 16, please listen. Unto the woman, he said, or God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and conception. If God has greatly multiplied your sorrow and conception, imagine if you were to greatly decrease your sorrow and conception, how easy it might be to have babies. It might be like, plop, plop, fizz, fizz, another little boy it is, or a little girl it is, okay? And it says, thou shalt bring forth children, listen to this, 
and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That does not mean that your husband is going to be good looking and you're going to desire, oh, he got pretty pectoral, big chest muscles. He got big bicep. He's so cute. And I just desire him. It's like, oh, just come and love on me. No, no. I really won't even have to go through it and explain this. I'm going to show you the next place where you see that same terminology. Listen to Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. You see, Cain got preached to by the first prophet that Jesus mentioned. I haven't determined yet if Adam was a prophet. I'm pretty sure he was. Why is that? Because Christ is the last Adam. But G Ab Abel is the one that Jesus mentioned when he talks about um, from Zechariah to uh, Berechiah, Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you slew. And he talked about all the prophets you have killed from Abel to Zechariah. So Cain rises up and kills his brother Abel because his gift wasn't accepted and he was rejected. So before he does this, before he does this, he was warned. He was warned what's going to happen. He was rejected. Just read 6 and 7, Tim. You don't have to talk anymore. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you wroth? And why have your countenance fallen? If thou doest well, uh, shall not thou be accepted? Mm -mm. That's a strong sermon right there. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Now imagine this is the door. And sin is lying at the door. See my hand right there, Andrina? Sin is lying at the door. And the Bible says, and unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. He, look, 5 and 8, Peter. 1 Peter 5 and 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Walking about, desiring you. Walking about, desiring to overcome you. Walking about, to desire you. Walking about, to eat you up. So sin is lying at your door, can't do well. And you can rule over him. Eve, your desire is going to be to your husband. And he shall rule over you. You are going to want to rule the man. That's not the order. You want to be the helper to him. And then what men have done over the years since God set that in order, they have taken and made women chattel. He never told you to make women chattel. He never told you to sell your wife or your daughter as a whore. He never told you to beat them and, and mistreat them the way that they do. He never told you to do these things. The value of a woman was of such that if somebody that was qualified wanted to marry your daughter, he would have to pay you a dowry to marry that woman. And she would be have, able to have part of that and the replacement of the value that has been taken from the home would be restored. Now, to go back to our sweet message, am I clear? Why I'm saying feminism, because right now we don't we, we let feminism take so much place in America. We want men to act like they're women. We want men to wear panties. We want men to wear dresses. We want men to carry skirts. We want to say everybody can determine what their sex is, and God has already said what it would be. And now we have women that say they're men. Their desire is to rule over us. They made these things movie called Amazon. And, and they, well, if you read Isaiah chapter 3, you'll see the curse of a nation is when children and women rule over them in Isaiah chapter 3. And I'm going to say it again in case somebody look at it because I'm not teaching that tonight. Isaiah chapter 3, when God showed that Israel, you well, especially the northern kingdom, you were under a curse. So here's the weight of this. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. Her desire was to Moses, and Aaron is coming along with it. And you got a problem with the woman that he's married, and God didn't have a problem with it. He's shown. Sometimes people, listen, like if this, uh, this little niacin, if this was a glass of wine and I did this, and somebody got a problem with it, you don't get to tell me and rule over what God has said and take my liberty and then tell me I can't do it and God's not pleasing. This is what they were doing. 
And so what they did was attack his, not position, but his charge. Has God indeed only spoken by Moses? Of course not. There are 70 other men that we know of that he can speak. Has he not spoken by us? Aaron, he's allowed you to speak. He's allowed you to throw your rod down. He's allowed that. And Miriam, if you look at the 15th chapter, I'm not sure if it's the 15th chapter where the song of Miriam is. That may be Moses' song. Check that out. That I didn't lock that into my brain. But Miriam was a prophetess. That didn't mean she went and started telling the truth and preaching sermons to everybody. She had the women. She had the women, and she was able to teach the women and give them wisdom. When you get the address, let him know. It says, he has the Lord not among us spoken by Moses. He has not spoken by us, and the Lord heard it. What chapter is 15? I was right. Okay, thank you, precious. Here's the thing. In the book of Exodus, the Lord heard it. You see, and when, when you see Moses come to the book, Exodus 3, and it says, um, it talked about the children of Israel, Israel that cried by reason of their taskmasters and all of this. And, and God said, Moses, I, I, the cry of the children that come before me, I come to see about them. Children of mankind or the children of Noah, after the flood, they got ready to say, go to, go to, let us get brick and mortar, let us build a tower. God said, I, I, I got to see if it's so. The Lord heard it. The Lord judges. So the Bible said the Lord heard it. You don't want the Lord to hear you when you're in the wrong. One step to him. Listen to verse three. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth. And Drina, I started reading the Bible in earnest when I was about 17. I determined at 17 because I had seen men that I thought knew the Bible well. And I determined back then I never was going to let a man be able to preach something in the Bible that I hadn't read myself. And I read this and I got tilted. Because, you know, because in the Bible, it say the, the fourth book of Moses and I'm writing Moses is saying he's the meekest man on all the earth. I think, and you know, there are parties where God told him to write it. Well, let's look at what that means. Now, the man Moses was very meek. We take that to be a chump or to be humble above all the men that are on the face of the earth. But then Jesus said, come unto me, all you that, are, that, that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest to your soul, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, I want you to understand meek. I gave you an illustration a while ago. Imagine you got just one acre of land, but you got two strong oxes. And you, and you get started, you got about a month to get it plowed. If your ox are strong and healthy if you get them under the yoke and they'll do what you want them to do without attacking without coming back towards you you can plow that land up because they are very strong but they are meek they'll do what you need them to do under the yoke now let's say your neighbor has oxes but they fight each other they're rambunctious, and you have to end up killing them and eating them. There is no productivity to take place. What meek mean is your strength is under the control and power of God. That's what meek is. It doesn't mean that you're soft. It doesn't mean that he's walking with his pants down to the ground. It doesn't mean that he's got on flat shoes and being sweet. It doesn't mean that he won't tell the truth. You can't read what Moses has said and his actions and think what Moses said. Well, I can't say. I can't judge. He judged Aaron. He ground up that golden calf they made and ground in the powder and made them drink it. Yes, he did. Told Aaron, you better not cry. You better not mourn when your son went off of God's strange fire. And they, that he told Pharaoh, he said, yeah, just like you said, you won't see my face anymore. So you don't see weakness. You see control under power. And that's why when we look at our Lord Jesus the Christ, he says this, Father, I always do those things that please you. And then he said, 
and I'm going to paraphrase it. I'm, I'm asking you in front of all these people to raise Lazarus from the dead. I'm asking you to do this not because of the fact that I don't know what you're going to do for their sake. Are we meek? Or does our power override the yoke? As a matter of fact, do not yoke, yoke me, God. Well, it says the man Moses was very meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth. And Yahweh spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out here, you three. Come to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the three came out. Don't think you was saying, I'll come out here. We, we need to talk uh, for a minute. No. No. This was hot. Why? Because Moses is my servant. Moses does what I say. And here you come going against him. I'm going to show you the gravity of this. I'm showing you feminism. And I'm showing you jealousy. And it's trying to uproot. It's trying to overthrow the kingdom of God's order. Do you understand if Miriam got the rule and if Aaron got the rule and Moses was no longer ruling, when Moses tried to rule and say something different than what they say, the kingdom couldn't progress like God wanted it. That's why you have a father and a mother. I don't go in my brother's house and tell everybody how to live. I say this is what God say. This is how God said it. And then, and then if my brother say that is what God say, he's still ruling. Same thing if they don't know me. If it's a cousin, if it's a like the woman I met at the bank yesterday, want to talk like she loves God. I said, are you fornicating? She said, yeah, a little bit, something like that. I said, ma'am, how are you going to say you, you love God and you don't keep his word? I'm old. I take advantage of that. You know, you know, my half white, you know, being your 20s. You know, you probably expected me to hit on you or something. No, you got the you got the wrong one. I'm I'm here on a mission. When I come to you, I want you to see an angel. Understand what an angel is. An angel is not that I'm trying to put myself up. Angel is only a messenger. It's a function. Now, if the function happens to be by a celestial being, that's different. But you can be a messenger of God and how you how you conduct yourself, or you'll be a messenger or angel of the devil by what you do. Now let's read again. It's going to be good. The Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and to Aaron and unto Miriam, come out you three to the tabernacle of the congregation, and the three came out, and Yahweh came down in the pillar of the cloud. Don't just think the cloud came. It said, and Yahweh came down in, uh, that's a preposition, the pillar of the cloud, and stood in the door of the tabernacle, which is the house of God, and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. If somebody ever tell you God never called a woman, he called her then, but I don't think she's going to like this calling. And it says he called them, and they came forth, and he said, verse 6, hear now my words. You've given your words. You, I don't even know why you gave them. If there be a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known to him in a vision. Notice, I'm going to make him, I'm going to make myself known to him in a vision or in a supernatural vision. And I will speak to him in a dream. I will speak to him in a dream. That's among you. By the time we get to Jeremiah, I'll come and appear to Jeremiah. But we're talking about you at a particular time. You come out of the wilderness. I will appear to him in a dream. But listen, listen, listen. My servant, my slave Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. We're going to deal with that in a minute. But the point that I want you to see right here is that being faithful to God, it will override overthrowing the kingdom through jealousy, through envy, and even feminism. And a lot of times that's going to happen in people's assembly because most of the time it's women there. While all of us, 40 or 50 of us here, and it's only three of you all men. And most of you all are incompetent in other words. Why? Because we have stepped down on the job. And we make it hard on women by not doing what we should. Listen to what it says. With him, who is faithful in all my house, with him I will speak mouth to mouth. Understand this. I, he's going to see me. I will speak to him mouth to mouth, even apparently with clarity. 
and not in dark speeches. You ever wonder why sometimes you read something with the prophets and it's dark? He says, Mo, when you read Moses, do you ever understand how clear it is? Do you ever? This is why when you go and look at the prophets, say, go and check and see that it coincides with Moses. With Moses, I will speak apparently not in dark speeches. That don't mean dark like they talk about in politics. That means in riddles. And the similitude of Yahweh will he behold. I don't speak to Moses in riddles, and he will see my similitude. Listen to this. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Do you understand who your brother is? He has been elevated past being your brother. He has been brought to the point of being your leader. I want you to understand Moses is not regular. You think he's regular because you got some kinfolk blood in yourself. Moses is not so. Moses is my man. And you spoke against him and I'm talking to him. Do you understand that you've spoken against me? Do you understand how much you're showing that you hate me when you speak against Moses like that? The Bible tells me in that fourth chapter, I believe it is in Exodus, it tells when you look at Aaron, um, no, it's the third chapter. I know it's the third chapter. Look about the 17th verse. I, I don't know what I did, but somewhere um, in my notes, I don't, I don't need them. But third chapter around the 17th verse, when Moses is complaining, he can't talk and read it. Find it when Moses say he can't talk. And God said, I made your mouth. I know of all about you not being able to talk. And then when he says he can't talk, he says, I know Aaron, he can talk, and you're going to be to him as God, uh, and he's going to be to you as a prophet. He's going to speak your word. That's what, that's what I'm looking for. If not, I'll turn to it myself. But that's what happened. God had already shown Aaron. Aaron, Moses is the one I talk to. Moses will talk to you. And when Moses talks to you, then that's when you will have something to say. He is like God unto you. Did you find it? And so after he does that, he tells them the same thing with Pharaoh. You will be like God to Pharaoh, and Aaron will be your prophet. And so what ends up happening is, with this being known, here they come challenging Moses, Aaron. You know better. You should have never done that. As a matter of fact, I'll read it to you. The Lord, the Lord gave it to him. It's chapter 4, 10. It says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore now since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. The Lord said, Who made man's mouth and who made them dumb, the deaf, the seeing, and the blind. I'm not out of Lord. And then we move on down. And the anger of the Lord got kindled against Moses because he kept talking about he couldn't speak. And God didn't want to hear that no more. By the time you get to verse 15, it says, And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth I will teach you what you shall do. He shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be even as he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. The important thing for that is, is that for when Aaron got up there with Miriam and did that, that was too much. You knew your place. Has he only spoken by Moses? He ought to self-elevate himself. And God said, you exalt yourself, you get to be obeyed. Then the Bible says the anger of Yahweh was kindled against them. He departed. Imagine what it must have been. It doesn't tell you right away what he did for them to know he was angry. I don't know if fire, I don't know if, if he said it in a, a deep or hard voice, but it says, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed off the tabernacle. She, they have defiled the tabernacle. I'll show you how in a minute. And it says, the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and Miriam became leprous, white as snow. 
And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and she was a leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, listen to his heart now. Alas, the Lord, I beseech you, lay not this sin upon us, wherein we have done so foolishly. We have sinned. The point is, you didn't listen before. We had a problem. You knew back in Exodus 7 and 1, when the Lord had talked, and he had told Moses, I have made you a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, thy brother, shall be your prophet. And you went against him, you bucked against him, and you didn't expect God to come and do something about it. Now, Miriam is good as dead. If you don't know the laws of leprosy and hadn't gone through the book of Leviticus, leprosy is the skin start getting white, and it's not albinism, but your skin start getting white. Unless your skin is totally white, then you are clean. Uh, the skin started getting white it represented death and you could not be in the camp you would violate you would make everybody unclean you would make everybody else have that stench of death on them i'm talking about the spiritual stench of death and you would defile everything so they had to put her outside of the camp i want you to understand this he's showing miriam how bad this is because some people say why would god do that to her and not to him that was part of the reason that i showed that it seems as if from the verb that she had a lot to do with this, that she and that he's going along with it. And look who's pleading for her. It's not her pleading for herself. Look at it. And Aaron said, alas, my Lord, look, I beseech you, lay not this sin upon us. I, you're not leprous yet, but you don't know what might be coming. We have done foolishly. It was foolish when you did to start with, but you overrode it because you thought you were so important in the kingdom that you could overrule his word. Just like when people tell you you can be a carnal Christian and you can live like that. Romans 8 and 7 says the carnal mind is enmity against God is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that in the flesh cannot please God. Listen to what it says here. Let her not be as one dead. That's what leprosy is like. Let her not be as one dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto Yahweh, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Heal her, Lord. It ain't that big to me. I'm not so offended by it, Lord. You got little preachers now. Get a bubblegum degree from a bubblegum meal, or you pay some money, they give you a degree, or somebody like you, maybe you were dating their daughter, or, or, or maybe you were dating him or whatever, and they give you a, a minister certificate, and they get up and give you a trial sermon, or you get some kind of certificate, and you smiling and cheesing in there because you got this certificate, and now you're supposed to be able to be a preacher, or that you got it plastered up on the wall, and now you've got a chance to be a preacher, and somebody say something against you, you got a problem, don't touch the Lord and that, Lord, and, and do it properly no harm first of all if you if you understood the text that you wouldn't say that but moses is looking at this woman that would be left outside of the camp forever if god didn't heal her how does moses know god can heal leprosy well first of all he had stuck his hand in his bosom and pulled it out it was leprous put it back in it was well he's done it more than once he did in front of god and he showed it to the people. But he's seen everything else that God can do. So he asked God to heal her. One of the misconceptions about this passage is that people use this passage to say, don't ever speak against God's men. Actually, God is the one that was doing the fighting. God is the one that is dealing with these people. And unless God is speaking to you face to face like he did Moses, that's really kind of you know, a self-aggrandizement of yourself to put yourself that God speak to you face to face and mouth, mouth to mouth and tell you everything. So and so and that you leading the people and that you got a house to be faithful in. I don't see that. I do believe that there is some detriment that a person can get if they're telling you the truth and they're teaching you the truth and you fight against it. You're still fighting against God. But let's not minimize Moses. 
You see, people minimize Moses the way they minimize the apostles that follow Christ. They'll say that I'm the same kind of apostle like them. But then where are your scriptures? Where are your scriptures? And why are you not killed? A Fox's Book of Martyrs, Martyr, the only one I say that wasn't killed was John. Show me. Apostello means sent from God. A lot of people are sent from God. I mean, they use that word even when it wasn't religious to be an apostle. Jesus was called an apostle. Says in the book of Hebrews. Why? Because he was sent. And now let's read this again. Let it not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto Yahweh, Heal her now. I forgive her. I, I, look, I'm not hurt that bad. Point that I want you to see in that it's not about me being hurt, it's about God's order. It's about God's order. You have violated on so many ways. Your desire is not to a husband, your desire now as a woman is to rule over this man or to be equal to this man. Aaron, you have gotten in with her. Do you see what's going on here? Do you understand? I can replace you. I've already replaced your son. Do you understand, Moses? It's always bigger than you. It's about my kingdom, and I'm doing what I said that I was going to do. Let's get it. And the Lord said to Moses, if her father had been in her face, shouldn't he, she not be ashamed seven days? In other words, in that culture, if somebody spit in your face like you're a nasty dog, or if you something laying on the street that was nasty, you ever seen something so nasty you spit? It's just like, ooh, and you just, like, it, like it, maybe it was in your mouth and you spit, if you just spit. Should you not be a shame seven days to the restoration take place? That's what we're talking about. Let her be shut out of the camp seven days. Seven days to go through the whole process of the leprosy. And after that, let her be received in again. In other words, even if he did heal her right now, she got seven days. And Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And even with that, she's still important. Don't let that part slip. She was still important. She just had to be corrected. She just had to be put in check. She had to understand that the kingdom is not hers. The power is not hers. The power and the glory is not hers. It's not Aaron. It's not Moses. Understand, I came down. I spoke. I summoned you. I gave a judgment. I gave a procedure. I gave the healing. And yet, I still gave you a consequence. Then after the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness a parent. But what's the what's the significance of all of this, Tim? What's so important about all of this? What's so important to this? We got to go to Hebrews chapter three to find out. You see, God had made a statement. And this statement is, re is really repeated in the New Testament. Listen to what they did. They messed up. Listen to what it says in Numbers 12 and 6 and 7 again. And God said, or he said, hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him. In a vision, I will speak to him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house listen to how the writer of hebrews take this and show us what we need to learn to walk with god wherefore holy brethren the writer the, the writer to the book of hebrews calls them holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our profession christ jesus see how he's called an apostle but now what's that he sent from God, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses in all his house. Somebody might say, why did you skip what's faithful? It's in italics. But do you understand that that's what's being meant? Because it says also, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as was Moses, was faithful in all his house. Verse 3, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, in so much as he that has built the house has more honor than the house. In other words, however people were treated, however people suffered consequences under whatever they did to stop Moses from promoting an advancement of God's kingdom, understand it's worse when you do it with the Christ. 
understand also that whatever glory that Moses received, still more with Christ. So he says here, for every house is built by some man, but he that builds all things is God. And Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, as a slave, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. There are some things that's to come after Moses. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? Moses, that whole tabernacle, that whole system, all of those people in the kingdom, Moses was over that house. Christ is over this house, whose house are we? If conditional, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. Whose house are we? We don't understand that there was a significance in Moses. Why do you think he came back on the Mount of Transfiguration? He gets to see the person that he represented. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost say today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. We're going to see some of that when we move to our next chapter. But I wanted you to see this about him being firm over his own house. Why is that important, Tim? Because the book of Numbers thus far, what we've dealt with is God setting up the kingdom, God promoting them to move, to advance the kingdom for his sake, and it had to have his kingdom order. He set the order of leader, he set the order of rulership, and he sets himself as sovereign. Now, you see Aaron say to God, alas, my Lord, he called him Adon then. He called him sovereign, but you knew that before. You got too big. What was the kingdom that Moses was trying to set up for the house of God? Let's take a look at a few scriptures and, and then we'll go into discussion. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 16, this is the kingdom of that Moses was trying to lead the people to. This is the kingdom that Christ is trying to take us to. Moses was taking them through in training wheels. Christ is taking us through as full grown adult people without training wheels, without diapers, and we are going through with the spirit inside of us instead of a building that's dismantled and put back together. In Genesis 22 and 6, after Abraham had offered Isaac as a sacrifice, offered his only son. When I say only, the word monogenes, the only one of that type. We're not talking about Ishmael. Here it says, and God said, by myself I have sworn, saith Yahweh, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld thine son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, that's singular, as the stars in heaven, as the sand is by the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. Your seed is going to have to go to where the gates of his enemies are and possess his gates of judgment, his gates of security, and possess his land. And in thy seed, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed because thou has obeyed my voice. Listen to what God promised Isaac. Isaac, Genesis chapter 26, verse 2. Genesis chapter 26, verse 2. And the Lord Yahweh appeared to him and said, Go not down to Egypt. But dwell in the land that I shall tell thee of. So journey in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee. For unto thee and to thy seed will I give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear to Abraham thy father, and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give to, this, to thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Listen, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now, all this was before the Ten Commandments was given. Had Abraham and Moses been able to do that, and the people did that, they would have kept God's laws, and they would have kept his laws 
on the inside, and it wouldn't have been about the sheep, it wouldn't have been about the goat, it wouldn't have been about the circumcision, it would have been about keeping these laws that Abraham kept. Am I, am I clear? Genesis 28, listen to see what Isaac, what he, and I, we did Isaac, let's look at Jacob. In the 28th chapter, we know that, well, if you don't know it, I'm going to tell you, Jacob is going to go, and he's trying to get away from his brother. He's going to go to Padanaram to get a wife. Esau wants to kill him. Jacob is, and he's scared, and he's out there, and he's asleep, and he gets this vision, and this is what he sees. And he sees this ladder or the staircase going to heaven. Genesis chapter 28, verse 13. And the Lord, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am Yahweh Elohim. I'm the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac, the land whereon you lie, I will give to thee, and I will give it to your seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee and in thy seeds all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. He comes again in chapter 35, verse 10, after they had to kill the Shechem. Well, they didn't have to kill him, but Dinah got raped and Levi and Simeon said, this ain't going to be. And they killed the Shechemites and plundered them. And so now they're getting ready to leave and God appears to him again in Genesis 38 and 10. And God said unto him, this is to Israel, thy name is Jacob. I shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And God said, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give thee, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. Tim, why are you reading this? Tim is reading this to say that they were going to take the land. They were going to take the land. They were going to spread the kingdom of God. They were going to take the land back from the evil dominion of the fallen ones, of the principalities, of the powers. They were going in to establish the kingdom of God, not to mix with them. And God was showing the nation that they got a God close by, a God that deals in righteousness, a God that deals in justice. And Moses was faithful in all of that house. And Moses was taking the people there. And it wasn't Miriam's place that usurped that authority. She wasn't talking to God face to face. It wasn't Aaron's job to get in with that and to take his place and neither is it our place to go get somebody and say that they're the Christ ain't going to do that well when Paul talks about that he talks about that in Romans chapter 4 and when he talks about it in Romans chapter 4 he's making it plain that Abraham is the father of nation not just the nation of the Israelite where you get that from Tim Romans 4 and 12 it says when he's talking about Abraham the father of circumcision, 12 don't sound as good as if I get, I'll get 11 and bring it to. It says, and he received the sign of circumcision. That's Romans 4 and 11. It's quoting from Genesis 13. I mean, 17. I don't know why I said 13. It's quoting from Genesis 17. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal, the seal of righteousness. Now, notice, it's the seal of righteousness, of the faith that he had when he wasn't circumcision that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. The father of them that believe, though they be not circumcised. All families of the earth, he was promised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who are uh, not of circumcision only, but who walk in the steps of the faith of the father Abraham, when he was being uncircumcised, uncircumcised, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world. Notice, did you miss that? Verse 13, for the promise that he should be heir of the world, not just Palestine, not just the promised land, not just Palestine. Paul said what God was promising Abraham, what he went in Genesis chapter 26 and promised Isaac, what he promised Israel in chapter 28, well, he was still Jacob in chapter 28, and Israel in chapter 35, is that they would be heir of the world, heir of the world. It was not to just Abraham 
or his seed through the law, but the righteousness which is of faith. For if they which are under the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is of none effect. And people that want to do God like they do the Messiah, like they did Moses, they say, have we not seen, can we not say that Christ came and what Christ is saying, everything he said in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, don't go, we are not under the law. First, Abraham got that promise. He was not under that kind of law. He was under the righteousness of God's law. He wasn't under ceremonial law. And the individual, that's why he said if they're circumcised and they believe, they get it. If they're uncircumcised or circumcised in all that it will be imputed to them. Am I clear? Because I don't want to say the thousand hundreds. So Galatians chapter 3 explains it in a different way. Why did you why did you go that, Tim? It looked like you're going somewhere else. Because it's important to understand that the kingdom of God is not for you to sit up in your church building and clap your hand and get happy or you get serious face and get it's really about doing what the wicked do. They advance their kingdom. We don't advance our we act like Christ is not spoken. Galatians three and six says, even as eight three and six, even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham's seed. As the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, all families of the earth will be blessed through him. In other words, the kingdom will spread through you. He preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee all nations shall be blessed. Chapter 22 is when he made that swear. After he offered Isaac, and there was a ram in the bush where God had prepared himself a sacrifice. Read the chapter, you'll see. So verse 9, so then they which be of the faith, so they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Listen, this is important. For as many are the works of the law are under the curse. Notice it didn't say just the law. He's going to explain what the law is when you got a problem with the law. For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. Abraham had already followed God's law before that book was ever written with all of the things that you had to do ceremonially. I just need you to understand by verse 11, but no man is justified by the law or the works of the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. If the law tells me to do something, but if I'm doing what God say by faith, I don't have to be controlled by this sacrifice, by this circumcision, by this going here, or whatever it is that I can do and not be righteous. That's why David said, Lord, sacrifice and offering you didn't want. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah, is it chapter 3 or chapter 7 of both? God did not demand sacrifice and offering. He said, obey my voice. He's quoting from the 19th chapter of Exodus. When he first called, obey my voice. So he says, the law is not of faith. Why? It was added because of transgression. But anyway, the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from what? The curse of the law, not the law. Not the righteousness of the law, because Romans 8 and 4, the same man said the righteousness of the law must be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8 and 4, if you're writing. And then it says, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Here is the kingdom advancing through doing what Messiah says by not overriding Messiah's order. By not going into your feminism, not going into your jealousy. You are not going to, because most of the time, come out and say, I'm going to take your place, and God, I've spoken by you, have spoken by me, like you did to Christ. But what you do is say you're in the spirit. What you do, you're talking a tongue. What you do, the Holy Ghost told you, and often it will contradict the Messiah. And it's the same equivalent. You are not letting the kingdom progress like it should, and God's going to deal with you. And it says that the blessing, I'm in verse 14, that the blessing might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak of the man of men. 
but though a man's covenant. It said, but though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it's confirmed, no man disannul or added thereto. He's going to say, if me and me and this brother make a covenant, nobody can come and add something to it or take away. Verse 16, now he's going to explain. Now to Abraham and his seed were this promises made. He said, not unto seeds as of many, but as one as to the seed, which is Christ. And every time God say you and your seed is always singular. Paul said it's one, not many, because Christ is the heir. That's why the Bible said we are joint heirs in Christ. Read it again, Tim. Now to Abraham and his seed with the promises made, he said, not unto seeds as of many, but of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant, which was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, 430 years after he had made this promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, or in Genesis 15, where it says, for, for, for 400 years your seed will be a stranger in the land, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise a non-effect. This was a promise that he had given Abraham, and he told Isaac, I gave it to him because he kept my commandments, my statutes, and my ordinances. So he says, for inheritance, the kingdom, the spreading of the kingdom, be of the law, it is no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Last verse. Wherefore then serveth the law? Why all these ordinances? Why this tabernacle? Why this feast day? Why that feast day? Why this so and so? Why this leprosy? Why this clean? Why this unclean? It says, What serveth the law? It was added. It was added because of transgressions. Till, till me a particular time. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The promise was made to Christ. It wasn't made to you. It wasn't made to Tim. It wasn't made to your church. It wasn't made to the Greeks. It wasn't made to the Catholic Church. The promise was made to Christ, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And unless you are in Christ's house, Unless you are his house, and his house, whose house are we? Unless you are cry in Christ and become a joy and with God and with Christ, you are kept out. The promise was made to that seed. And all of this other stuff that you see, the laws and things were added for the people. But to Christ, it wasn't necessary. He didn't need that. He didn't need to be baptized because he was doing wrong. He didn't need, he actually did those things and was sanctified just like the priests were. The recap is this. They set up a kingdom in the wilderness. They had order. God was going to help them grow. They didn't like the way he did it. They didn't like the food that he gave them. They didn't like the food that they didn't get to have. They didn't pay attention to the trumpets blowing whenever he was supposed to go out. They didn't like the fact that the cloud would lead them certain times. Now we end up seeing that they want to overthrow the government of the kingdom that is supposed to rule the world, the gates of the enemies, that the heathen would be blessed by, that all the uncircumcision would be blessed by. They had disorder in the, in the very camp that was supposed to spread out. They wanted to override the man that was over the house, not knowing that the man that was over the house, he's only following God and those people that were supposed to help him, they wanted equality. Women want this woman wanted to take over, and God had to say, Look, it's got to be my way, my order, because it's my world. I don't want you to get any credit for what I do. So, how are we going to advance the kingdom? Are we going to be like them? Well, I can cheat on Ann and still be in the kingdom and override God's rule. I can go steal from people and override God's rule. I can hear stuff on the news about people and repeat it without checking it out and slander and still go against God's rule and say, haven't God spoken by me? I've talked on over a thousand lessons on the web and on the podcast, and, uh, and, and now I can speak for God. No, 
No, no. He speaks for himself. He uses us as vessels. So hopefully this, this little bit that I gave us today showed that it's bigger than us. It's bigger than a leader. It's bigger than people that want to be elevated. It's really about submitting to God so his kingdom can advance. That's what he's about, possessing gates of his enemies. The gates of spiritual enemies, principalities, powers, gates of human enemies. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask you to allow us to realize you're in charge. We don't get to change your rules. Whether I'm young and I want to be elevated because I'm not old enough, whether I'm a man and I want a position of this, or I want to have a transgender, or whether I want to rule as a woman and everybody else is doing it, everything else has changed in life. I just, I just want to be able to have some say so. But the prayer that we say, thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, thine is the glory. He sets the agenda. And I pray that we will start reading God's word to know what his agenda and what his agenda is and not be led by people that will move us away from it. With that, I want to pray and open for discussion. Father, your word is weighty. It's full of history. And yet it's full of directives. Help us to look at what's been indicated in your word and find what's imperative for us to do that we may advance your kingdom. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. I open our class for discussion right now. If there's any discussion or if I've confused anyone, I'm sorry. But, you know, people want lightweight messages. You found a lot of them, but I'm I'm looking and hoping that by the time I die and I'm no longer on this planet, or even now that somebody that don't have access to the materials that I have, they can take this and they can learn a little bit and move on with that. To God be the glory. Any discussion for tonight? Anybody? Even if it's someone on the web, if they type in, then I should get it. Hello there. I hear I hear some sounds. Did you say Miriam was still necessary at one point? When well, Miriam was what? Did you say she was still necessary? No, I don't remember, but I, but she was. I mean, I mean, I, she had a place with women. She had she had a role, but the fact was is that there was nobody to be equal to Moses. And it seems as if God wanted people to see that. I mean, it's almost as if y'all didn't know that. That was his question. You didn't, do you remember going through Exodus and one time the people didn't do right and so Moses had him another little tent away from the people. He had come down off the mountain. He was glistening, shining. And he had his own little, and God, temple, when his um, cloud would come in and talk to Moses, they knew he mm -hmm. was. They, look, Gary, when I was young, there were certain guys on the street I just didn't mess with, okay? Uh, he's already cut somebody or shot somebody. And, you know, you, you just know certain people. They just don't care how they treat you. And here's God. And you treat Moses like that. I would I would not want to mistreat a gangster's child. Did you know that was my child? Yeah, but I didn't like what she said. And you slapped my child. <laughs> That's what do it you, came to. Go ahead. Do you think she was um, restricted from speaking based on the way this text was? I mean, I mean, it, when I read it, I mean, it just stood out really to me this time. I mean, because you know, Aaron would Aaron would speak for uh, Moses, but it, it almost seems like um, uh, that Aaron has the reaction as opposed to her. At least we hear him speak, and that that stood out to me right here. So, what what do you have you thought about that at all, or read anything on that? No, it's like a little shroud of of darkness. But I'll give you the light that I have. 
The light okay. that I have, I believe she already looked at herself and she knew she was leprous. Mm -hmm. And I don't want nothing else to say. And you could look at Aaron and he wasn't leprous. Mm -hmm. And you already been taught what it means to be leprous. Even even before you had uh, the, the, what you call the laws in Leviticus, they seem mm -hmm. when Moses did that, it's as if I know what leprosy is. This is like a curse. Uh, it's almost like you was already something considered to be dead or like you're dying, but in mm -hmm. the people around, but God say, uh-uh, you don't let that come in my camp. I don't want it in my camp. I don't want it nowhere around. And so he gave the dimension now of what defilement is when we fool with the dead I give mm -hmm. you we don't understand that fornication is like leprosy we don't understand that lying is like leprosy mm -hmm. we don't understand that whatever it is that defiles us that which will cause the individual to die in, in other words Romans 8 and 13 say if we live after the flesh you shall die well yeah. leprosy it's like you're dying. Fornication is you're dying. You are living after the flesh. You commit adultery, you're living after the flesh. You're homosexuating, you're having your homosexual thing. You're, you're trying to change your gentle to go up to, uh, uh, outside of God's order. You are already experiencing, in one sense, that which is death because you are killing yourself to God's order and saying, I prefer my own. Mm. And so I said she saw it. You ever looked at okay. your hands? You ever looked at your hands and say, "Why my hands dry? Or my hands look all greasy? Or when I get, <laughs> or, or, or sometimes I got a cut. I don't even know how I got it. Imagine you're a black woman and all of a sudden now you're looking white. Because I mean, if you are already white, what difference would it make if your hand was turned white like snow? That's good. I, it, it it almost seemed to me like it was like a physical one, but that 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 makes sense uh, to me. That 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 is good. That is good. Um, with being outside of the camp, can you can you speak? A, I don't know if you've read something because I I don't remember reading something really detailed about that. I think it's I think it's there, but I. It's outside of the sacred space that was guarded. Mm -hmm. There's a place where the defiled things could be, like you mm -hmm. can take song outside the camp. Uh, the, the scapegoat would get it would go and it would send it off to the wilderness. But outside the camp, you you, you can't be in there with your dirt. In, in other words, you got this on you like death. And you can't be inside. You will defile everybody. You will spread your stench. You will spread that death. You will spread that defilement. And that's the same kind of thing that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5. He said, did not mm -hmm. chill eat with the fornicator. Did not tell you not to eat with the reviler. Did not tell you not to eat with the drunkard. Now we're not talking about those in this world or else you have to go out of the world. But if any man call himself a brother. Right. And that sap sucker, he gonna be wicked anyway. He gonna be ungodly anyway. You know what? Because sometimes the message that we teach is gonna be on the web later. I'm going to 1 Corinthians 5 and 12 so I can read where it is. Actually, 12 is too far down. Let's go to 9. This man had been laying up with his father's wife like Reuben did. Reuben laid up with his father's wife, and you find he did that in the 35th chapter. That rascal did that. Laid up with um with, Re with Reuben's other wife, Bilha, and, and then in the 49th you mean, you mean, Huh? You mean, uh... You mean not not Reuben? Yeah, Jacob. No, with, uh, Reuben laid up you, with Jacob. You said Reuben laid, laid up with Reuben's wife. No, he didn't. Lay, he did that too, but that that wasn't the problem. The problem when he did it with Jacob. But then, I, but see, I, when I was reading it the first time, I was like, why he didn't say nothing about it? Then when I got to chapter forty nine, then he said it. And the way that the yeah. black people read it, he said. 
she claimed he climbed up into my father. He, his father said it did found. It's so bad they make it be out of breath. But here it is, First Corinthians chapter five, verse nine. I wrote you in an epistle, not the company of fornicators. The church, we're so full of them. We don't see it like God did. If Miriam and Aaron had seen that that defilement of going against God's order, having their own desire, having their own jealousy, having their own egalitarianism, what we call it feminism, if they had saw it was that bad that God was going to do that, they wouldn't have done it. But God was trying to teach. That's what the training wheels are for. I told you in the epistle not the company with fornicators. Yet, yeah, not all together with fornicators of this world, or with covetous, or with expressionists, or with idolaters, but then you must go out of the world. 11, qualification. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. If a brother in the church, you know he's going to lay up with, with his girlfriend. I don't care if they play the organ. I don't care if they do the drum. I don't care if he preach. I don't care if he teach Sunday school. I don't care if he drive the bus. If he's a fornicator, if he does a little Islam on the side, he's a fornicator. If he despises God, Bible called Esau a fornicator. He married those doggone Hethite women. It says, be a fornicator or covetous. Greedy. You people have covetous pastors. The tithe is the covenant. And they get the tithe. Right on your tithe. Money cover. Money cover. Money cover. Or you get this other, this, this, like what that big head guy name was. Uh, somebody say I'm talking about him. But his head big is John Avanzini. And then I, I don't pray, God, let me give you the hundredfold blessing. And they just walk around like little charlatans, like when I used to walk, watch the Westerns. And they come around in that buggy and they take this miracle water and this miracle water, this elixir, it'll heal you. And they'd have two or three people that would act like they would do it and sell it. Covetous, idolater, or a railer. This is a slanderer. We have people slander because you saw it on the news. You saw it on the propaganda news. And, and you just slander. You think it's okay because you heard it. Exodus 23 said, don't join in with them. Or a drunkard. Or an extortioner. With such a one, no, not eat. That's like putting them outside the camp in the New Testament. But what about to do to judge them? Say, but what about to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that without God will judge. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. He's given. He's going back to the <laughs> method. Don't defile the assembly. Don't defile God's house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the profession firm to the end? And we got people saying, well, they're babies in Christ. They're babies in Christ. Let me go join a real gang or the mafia. They let me join. And they said, well, I just snitched one time. I'm just a baby. <laughs> well, let me join one one time and I speak against the boss. Or... Or, or if I join the gang and say, man, you wrong for that. He should not, he shouldn't have shot her. That's just wrong. He need to apologize. They're not going to put up with me. But yet when it comes to God, we just throw him any kind of thing. What else you got, Gary? You're so kind. I mean, this, this is good. Um, I was thinking that um, in this verse six, trying to see if it reads this way elsewhere where they didn't listen in the beginning and then they have to listen. We're going to listen one way or the other. You will. And sometimes, sometimes it looks like there's this space, but there's re there's really no, there's no space. We, 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 you know, the Bible talk about you deceive yourself. And so they were, they, they were deceived. And it, it also showed people because this is, this is, this is so close to having seen miracles. This, I mean, as you Speaking about how God would um, appear 
to Moses, I mean, when he, when he would cry before the Lord, you know, um, I mean, I mean, I, I know it's, it's in uh, the way this text is, it's, it's really about to get, um, I mean, it's about to start rolling, but um, it, it shows how mm, neglig negligent we can be if 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 we are not careful and 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 i believe it also shows how god you know when when the bible says um the other nations will look and say what nation is like this where their god is so near how much nearer can you be if he's in your heart you know and that's what he was really striving for i mean he, in, in in these um these earlier texts you see god would talk about circumcision of heart circumcision of heart and so you can see a lot of stuff, but if you've not written on your heart, it really means nothing. Amen. And so to to really be near to him, he, he needs not just on your heart, because people be saying, well, I know, I know. You know, I, I tell some people every now and then somebody say, God knows my heart. And I'm like, you, you ought to be scared. I don't think they understand, you know, when I've said that, it's just like it means nothing. But um, to see the nearness that they had him um, proximity wise, and it still didn't do anything. So, um, it, 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 I think with with this lesson, and I think as you um, what's the word expounded upon it, it, we we should we should be careful, really really be careful because they had seen a lot, and their Moses was, I mean, but. We we've we've seen a lot. Um, we've read a lot. So um, I, I I thought it was a good message. Uh, got a question with uh, address, and I I don't I was writing as you were, were talking, and um, I thought it, that it was it. But then when I went back, I'm like that can't be. You were talking about Abraham a lot near the end, and I thought you called out Genesis 10, but I was thinking in my mind it was probably 26. Uh, I think you did refer to 26, like five, 26 and 5. Um, am, am I wrong on that? And, and if you did call it Genesis 10, will you tell me what, what, how do you, how did you connect in Genesis 10? I said one time that God came down to see about what they were doing. I, I may have said Genesis chapter 10, but I remember, I don't remember talking about the table of nations. I said he came down in chapter 11 to see what they were talking about, but I know mm -hmm. that I, what I did say, I talked about Genesis 22 and 18, 22, 16 through 18, where he promises Abraham that he swears because of what you mm -hmm. did, I'm going to the gates of your enemies. He reconfirms it to Isaac in 26, 2 through 5. He confirms it, then he tells him, because Abraham kept my laws. And then he talks about it again in 28 when Isaac, I'm not Isaac, but Jacob sees the stairs and he's on the top mm -hmm. left. I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to give you, I'm going to put, and all the nations going to be blessed through you. He talks about it again in the 35th chapter when he promises he's like, you're not going to be called Jacob anymore. And he promises him that. And the one that I didn't read because I decided, I said, okay, time is running out, but I want you to hear this one. It's only, it's very short. So if you've made notes, in Deuteronomy 22, I mean 28 and 1, verse 2 and 15. 28, 1, 2, 15. Deuteronomy 28 and 1 says, and know this is the blessing and curses, so that kind of help you lock it in. In 28 mm -hmm. and 1 it says, and it shall come to pass if you will hearken diligently unto the voice of Yahweh your God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I Look at that, I'm over this house. Which I commend you this day, the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. I, the stuff I promised them, I'm promising you. You already know about Deuteronomy 4, that all the nations would have come and learned from you. But the mm -hmm. other side of that is verse 15. But, but, that's the but. Mm. It shall come to pass if you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God 
to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. If you don't advance my kingdom, then the kingdom of darkness is going to overtake you. If you don't choose life, you're choosing death. If you don't choose blessing, you're choosing cursing. And I'm the one that's going to see that it happens to you. And we think that we are exempt. How in the world can you read all that in Revelation? If you overcome, you get to eat with me. You get to eat from the tree of life. Revelation, if you overcome, I'll give you a white stone. I'll give you a new name. You get to rule and reign with me. But if you don't, you know, he's the same. That was Moses' house. And notice he didn't say, if you keep all the sacrifices, if you keep all of the feast days. I'm not denigrating the feast days. I'm not doing it because you had to do that because that was, it was teaching. But there was something behind it. I think I told myself to remember the 29th chapter. I don't remember if it's the 14th verse, but it's very, or the 16th verse, is that God hadn't given you an eye to see and an ear to hear after this day. Let me try 29 and 4. Yes, yes, because I, because Ann told it to me one day, and I said, I don't want to ever have that erased from my mind. Look at what happened. He had said in verse 1, I mean 2, you've seen all that Yahweh did in Egypt. Now, if I were to go through all that, that's another hour. Somebody say, it don't take that. It's like, really? You have no idea what he did. He was doing it in harvest time when he was showing out. It was all he did in Egypt to Pharaoh and to his service and to all his land, the great temptation which your eyes have seen, those great miracles. Yet, Yahweh have not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear until this day. Look, even when you were cursed, even when you were bearing a curse of your parents, and I have led you 40 years in the wilderness, and your clothes have not waxed old. I can preserve your clothes. I got preserved the clothes in the Dabin Abbey who I said, if your clothes didn't wax old and your shoes are not old on your feet, you don't even have to worry about getting corn. A bunion or your shoes wearing out on the heel and twisting your ankle. He just goes on to say, You haven't seen. And this is the very thing that happened a lot of time under the sacrificial system. You didn't see. You didn't see. You're going through the motion. And how many people can clap their hands and sing, go to church, glance through their Bible and still haven't seen that it's it matters how you live in your home. And see, it matters how you treat your wife. And see, it matters how you work on your job. And see, it matters that you're not out here fornicating, adulterating, homosexuating. It matters that you don't think you're a prophet when you're not. You're going to tell the future because you think something's going on in Iran or Iraq and somebody tell you somebody's a great man and you listen to them and you don't even go back and do the, the history. You think it's okay to say black people this, that, and other, and you don't go back and look at the history, see what's still on the books against them, and you keep talking. You don't have eyes to see what's injustice. And just because I hadn't said it a minute, I ain't forgot. I haven't forgotten. And God knows when I teach the book of Exodus, you're going to think he's trying to teach American history. No, the parallels are there. They were killing your children, and you said you want to go back to Egypt. What a damnable fool you are, because you, you enjoy the sensuality of eating. Go ahead, Andrina, say it. It was on your lip. I saw it. <laughs> I, I was getting ready to say that, but I am going to say now that <laughs> um, that was easy to see. You know, uh, that murmuring, that complaining, that lust, it was fully in the open. Uh, it was it was vocalized by many in a way that could not be ignored. But when you look at Miriam's descent, I like that word. It's it was it was harder to detect for them 
because you got two men of God and they're hearing from him and they didn't think it was that bad. So when you don't think it's that bad, God say, yes, it is that bad because this is real descent. This is against me. And it has officially been said that you are my spoke. And she has decided, in her opinion, <laughs> her own opinion, okay. her opinion to dissent from what had officially been given. But they didn't see it. They like, oh well, yeah, she said it, but it ain't really that bad. And he said, I can show you how bad this is. Can you hold that thought? Please go. I got to get us to our people. Always look at what God's penalty for something is to determine how bad it is. Whether it's mm -hmm. rape, whether it's murder, whether it's stealing a man, whether it's taking him as a slave against his will, whether it's slapping your mama, cursing your parents. Always don't reason from what the world we think in wicked, godless America. Always look at from what God did. And when Ann brought this, like, I, I need to be able to say that. And you said, um, they didn't think it was so bad and go ahead from there. Okay, so they didn't think it was that bad. So neither one of them looked like neither one of them passing the judgment when it fell on their face. You know, judge what she said to be uh, egregious. But he had to say, listen, this is the same dissent. This is the same murmuring. This is the same complaining. You may see it differently because this is your sister. Ooh. This is, you are closer to her. She's older than you. Whatever the reason is, for some reason, you didn't examine it, you know, as closely as you If were. it had been Quayton's sister, it might have been yeah, different, yeah. right? Yeah, so, you know, and you see this, this descent, even with Messiah, where they say, you know, he's beside himself. Your mama and them outside, they came to pick you up, you know, because you don't know what you're doing. But you see the same descent, and you understand that it's like certain things are apparent and uh, more blatant that you can see, and maybe it has something to do with the person, you know, that you don't pay that much attention to it, that you don't say, okay. This is something I need to go to God about. And this is something that should be examined more closely because this is something that she's, yes, that's true. He, he spoke by other people too. And just the reason she said, and I don't know if it's, it seems to me maybe this Ethiopian may have been a real wife to her husband. Mm -hmm. And she may have had some influence too. You mean like like when like that man this week that called me because you told me not to work for him this week, so he got somebody else to call. Like that kind of influence yeah, you have over so, me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it may have been that Miriam may have felt like she was losing some power. Okay. With mm. that, and it's like, and you not for some reason. Like I want to say it's the woman, but then she says, "Has not everybody? Whoa. Has we all been? You know." Or is Moses not the only one right. that he has spoken by? So she goes to him speaking for God, but it says underneath that it was this woman. So apparently she may have had some influence in the, in what he was saying and his decision making, and he may have been consulted with her. And, and but God didn't have a problem with that. That's right. Because he made them one. So I think she did. It looks like she may have had some problem with that because it's like whatever decision he made or whatever he pronounced or whatever, you know, whatever meeting or whatever they had, he may have decided to do it her way. I said, well, that's good. That's godly. That doesn't mean she just because she an Ethiopian don't mean she don't know the law of Cushite or whatever. Doesn't mean she wasn't following the law, statutes, and commandments. But to for her to say that and then say, He's spoken by us as if we're going to override what he's already said by saying we can speak too. So just that influence, you know, that may have been a problem. 
with family, that's true, that, that's true too. But just being able to look at it in that way. And I like the way you talked about advancing the kingdom and the way you went and showed, you know, through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and how they were supposed to, and Moses, and how they were supposed to move and advance the kingdom. And I want to add into that, that the reason the kingdom does not get advanced is because of this type of descent. Mm. It causes delays. It causes disruption. Um, it takes away from the glory that the other nations were supposed to see and supposed to understand and draw him in, draw them in to him and glorify him. So that's what I thought. I like that. I, I appreciate it very much. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. That's why I like that's why I like you to have something to say because that other orb that uh goes through. That other I I thought about a scripture that I, I know y'all don't like this scripture because you know sometimes people use a scripture and it, it it leave a bad taste in your mouth <laughs> because of the way because of the way that they, they decide to chew it up and spit it out. Mm-hmm. But Hebrews 12, where it talks about obeying your leaders. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 12 and 17. 17. Obey your Ooh. leaders. Them, for they are keeping watch. Or this is ESV. Keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you and so it's that seeing who god has chosen understanding it and not deciding you're gonna you know uh manufacture dissent and say i'm not gonna you know i have i'm of a different opinion and you can do that in different ways you don't have to be like moses i mean like miriam and say it you can just not listen yes you can just not heed and do what you want to for years and years and years but he's watching and he knows and sometimes you wonder why things are not different because you have people among you who are dissenting they are dissenters yes and you don't know it or you haven't paid any attention to it so that's yeah. that's it for me in 13 and 7 did i say 12 and 17 because i know it's 13. 13 and 7 and 13 yeah and 13 and 7 remember those that have the rule over you who have spoken to you the word yeah. of god yeah. whose faith follow yeah. considering the end of their conduct or their conversation right. and that's and how i think the other after that yes who have the rule submit yourselves for they watch for your soul that they may do it with joy and not grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And you think he's not drawing that from what we call the Hebrew scriptures? How in the world could he not be drawing it from there when he just got through talking about Melchizedek in chapter, right there, right, right there at about chapter seven, and then you start seeing him talk about all the stuff with Moses and his tabernacle, and he go through all of the Hebrew people, well, not all of them, but a lot of them in chapter 11, and say, let's get the conclusion of the matter. Let, let's look at Jesus, the I, author. Go ahead, Precious. I was thinking about the spitting in the face. It was another place that it was, it called for. That one they, with the shoe and the roof, is that it? When they when the guy wouldn't marry his, um, the do the letter right vow? Uh, is it in Deuteronomy 2, or is it just in Ruth? I think it's in, I do I don't know. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cheat unless Gary know and I'm gonna just look up spit. All righty. Spit Deuteronomy 28, 25 and 9. Then shall his brother Thank come you. upon him in the presence of the elder and loose the shoe of his foot and spit in his face. And they it is saying they shall answer and say. So shall it be done unto this man, and when he will not build up his brother's house. That's, that's the problem. The spitting on their face that says you won't build up the house, you're breaking it down, you're tearing it up, and he was displayed, his displeasure with the leprosy. And he said, "Is it, it wouldn't it be that he spit on their face? Yeah. Hey, Jesus, you know what God showed me when you made me look at that? 
when you know your brothers, whether they're brothers in the flesh or brothers in the assembly, and you won't help them build up their house, mm. you know crap going on in there. You know the wife is cheating. And like I told the man, I said, you can't be my friend and cheating on your wife. I'm not going to hang out with you. I said, because if, you, if you're my friend, then your wife is my friend. You both are one. And she doing the same thing. So don't do not do it in front of me and think I'm going to be cool with it. But what I'm looking at is building up your brother's house because you know for a fact that there's a person in particular we talking about, what well, I'm talking about, and you had a talk today with that person. And how many times the things have been going on in their home where their children could have been blessed, where things could have went on. And we talked, and it was like not only dissent, I was despised, but I was trying to build up my brother's house because right. that way building it up was he built it up because the man died and he left no children, no inheritance. So you would go into his wife and have a child so his name could go on that child would be his. Right. Well, then there are times in, in our lives that things are dying in our relationships, mm -hmm. dying, dead, good for nothing. But we got enough life that we maybe we can graft some in or we can give a blood transfusion, talking spiritually speaking, right. and that we can give life. I believe the Bible talk about that. If a brother is overtaken and you will pray for that person to give life, I think it's first John five. I don't think I've ever used that scripture in my life. Um that I, I love it when the Lord give me some I hadn't used because they all are important. But it said there's a sin that's unto death. I don't even say pray for that because people be praying for everything. And then he talks about that. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, mm -hmm. he shall ask if God will give him life. Yes. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray. Is that, is that like First John 5, 15 through 17? 16. Something? Okay. So, so what, what I'm saying is is that we ought to be able to do something to cause the life. Jews say some you save with fear, hating even the garment. We snatched him from the fire, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. That's what we're about. But most of the time, we're like, well, I can't judge. We like the cartoon. <laughs> and we don't care. When you, use the, when you said the word desire, I can't remember where in... Uh, numbers where you was, you started going through the word desire and you went back to the reason I did that is that they were they were trying to take to over, rule over. Okay. to rule over and then I and that desire okay. the, the other picture was Satan desire oh, to devour yeah, okay. yeah. I thought about I think it's in Luke where he says Simon yes that's it that's a good one I, I need to lock it in I'll look it up because I want to lock that in my memory. Oh, Satan desires to, to have your sifuous weed. Yeah. And I pray so it's got to be close to the end, close to the time you're getting ready to be crucified. Is it 20? I don't remember. That's why I got to check why I try to remember stuff. Because I don't like to have to look it up. But I'm going to look up the word sift. Now you remember, yeah, if you, do yeah, but if you look at twenty-two and thirty-one, okay. But see what happened is when you use different version, they may not yeah. use that word. That's why I remember when I was young and people used to tell me stuff in the Bible. I lay a hundred dollar bill on the table. I said it ain't in the Bible nowhere. Show me you can have it. And they be looking and looking. Then one day somebody had a different version, and I didn't do that anymore because I think the um, Message Bible has cotton candy in it. But it's Luke twenty two thirty one. That's a good one. Satan has desired to have you, that he may sip you as wheat. That's good. So my question to you all that are on, you all are here with me. I, part of me was tempted not to deal with that, with Abraham, and the seed, and the heir of the world. But I, I saw that. It seemed that I needed to deal with that because when you keep talking about advancing the kingdom, it's like where? Mm -hmm. Where? It's the whole world. And that this was always promised. Mm -hmm. This is not new to advance the kingdom. And But then you're going to say we're going to do it without law. 
and the kingdom is of the king and king's laws, his words, his statutes of law. So to dismiss this, uh, the curse of the law, yeah. The works of the law, yeah, but your righteousness of the law, that's got to be there because that's his throne. Anyway, I tried not to bore because a lot of times when that when Paul does those kind of things and he uses more than two scriptures to explain it, it's like, I don't want to leave no room for folly, but we found some anyway as people. Those are, these are good. I like, I like this with Miriam. I, these are the things you learn from as a woman that you, you know, um, understand that it's not what you say. This is not uh, you got a not integrating it? you no. as a woman, but he has order and that order is to be respected. That that order is to be honored and, and be yeah, you should delight in it. I know I learned to delight in it because you start understanding that a lot of the weight comes off of you, you know, <laughs> but you have to be a single mother, single parent to, to feel that, you know. And to understand and to say, hey, God has created order and you need to seek it because that's your best way to be protected. That's your best way to be honored. He has already set it up for you. And so if you just seek it, you know, and go after it and don't go beyond, you know, what he has written. Don't go beyond what he has set up. And we are always tempted to do it. You know, sometimes I say, I don't like something, but I don't run nothing. That's the truth. And so it's like, and it'll be left that way. It'll say, I can say I don't like it, but I know I don't run anything. And I don't go any farther than yeah, that. Yeah, you say that to me. <laughs> yes. Often. But, <laughs> but, you know, but that's an understanding. Especially if somebody doing me wrong and you know that I've done what I could true. to help bless and build that person up. Yeah, because it's difficult. Why they still? Why they still it, around? You know, it's, it's difficult to watch it, and so it's like, yeah, I just want you to know I'm not cool with that. <laughs> but you know, I'm with you. Whatever you decide to do, you know, however you decide to handle it, and you know, if I need to make a case, I'll make a case. But I ain't ever gonna go beyond what he's ordered. But isn't it amazing that usually when that happened, that person they'll do something else. They 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 invariably they'll do something Always. so egregious yeah. and and that's not a joyful thing because you really you really care because other than that it would be easy to teach a beautiful lesson that people like okay th three points and two sub points i wouldn't need my bible mm -hmm. i mean and especially just telling a good story. I mean, I can listen to audio books and learn good stories. I just go out and listen to people on the street. But when it comes to people's soul, what is it about the Bible? And it's like, why is it you could go to church 30 years and not hear about Miriam, mm -hmm. about this order? Why is it that we got this big problem with women passing? I did some work for, for a lady the other day. And I was like, ma'am, I don't, I don't believe in women pastors. I don't see that's God's order. I mean, the Messiah chose. Like he, you say, it's a sign of a curse, and maybe that's exactly what it is. It, it, you it, know? Look at us. Yes. And, and they put, when I say they, our white slave master, they wanted the women to rule over us. And that way, to, even to this day, they wanted to be look like um, white women, white men, um Maybe then black woman oh, into a black man. Right. And that way we can be always subjected. Mm -hmm. And yet that's not God's order. I mean, the people make black people like they're nothing. But Abraham was up there with the Hethites, okay? That's where Hebron is. Abraham, Mamre, uh, Ephron, and all of them, the Hethites loved him. They loved him. They were brothers. You're a prince among us. And y'all want to make it like, all of a sudden, black people just coming up with something, some folly. First of all, who you think Esau was marrying and making making uh, Rebecca and Isaac up, upset? 
Well, every time you turn around, who you think Jesus came? You think you think Tamar came over there from um was a Viking? <laughs> no. But what ends up happening is, is when I say stuff like that, it doesn't matter. I say it does matter. I say the thing is, is that when the history and the people and everything has been kept from you, it shows that it matters because anything that was great, whether it's a ba when you talk about Beowulf, mm -hmm. when you talk about Leif Erikson and all of those, why that not hid? Why I get to know about them? Um, when I so, uh, but that doesn't it doesn't make me saved mm -hmm. or make me unsaved. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it shows me that God has worked with us. We haven't always been the dirt under somebody's shoes. We haven't always been. We haven't always been the squeeze under somebody's shoe, you know, to make the smell. It's only when we turn away from God that we that He make us dung on the ground. But well, when we turn back collectively, you know, in so many ways. So, but you, but when you turn mm -hmm. individually, you see His power. Yes, and I have to do that. Gary, Gary, you have anything else, my brother? No, this is good. Yeah. Just listening. Yeah. I, I think I hung up by, a few minutes ago by mistake, but I, I come back on. Well, don't don't be in sin, okay? <laughs> I, I don't intend to be. I don't want you to do it either, okay? You listen to your wife. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the Lord's will on Sabbath. We really want we want to go into this thirteenth chapter, and we want to talk about how how can people delay the kingdom of God's work? You see, because we they, we can see where they actually delay the kingdom of God, and why is it that the Lord hasn't come back? I believe it has a lot to do with our with what we do. I believe that. I believe that, right. and all these people talking about the Lord come back. Look how you live, and now you are you are not hastening the day of His coming. You are not hastening the day of His coming. And then there's another subtopic that'll be in that. It's like, how do you tell the false from the true prophet? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be in the big number? On the little number that you can barely see, mm. but the dog look the dog ain't scared in this one the dog the dog is gonna be good. The word Caleb means dog oh, okay the dog okay, okay. Caleb is <laughs> Caleb is the dog, okay he ain't no joke the dog and the savior <laughs> Lee so I appreciate you all joining in with us tonight. May the Lord bless us and keep us, make his face shine upon us, be gracious to us, and empower us to do his will, to the praise of his glory, to advance his kingdom and our role in it. Amen, amen, and amen. Mm -hmm.